Hello, my fine friends. Welcome to the Tom Petty Project podcast. I am your host, Kevin Brown. Um, before I start the intro, I just wanted to give a shout out to my friend, the wonderful, generous, and very hilarious Gwen Jones, um, who was a guest on season two, if you remember, and if you listened to that uh, episode. Um, she sent me this wicked custom uh, beer koozie. You can see that there um, with my podcast name on it. And then a photo of Tom on the back, along with uh, another one. This one. And I am feeling petty today. Um, and so I just wanted to sort of uh, say thank you for that. And she sent me this, this wonderful note that I'm going to read to you as well. So it says, uh, hi, Kevin. Thanks for all you do to keep Tom alive and in our hearts and for being such a great guy. Uh, stay petty, Gwen. And then there's a footnote that says, so now you have a one of a kind Tom Cousy. So again, thank you so, 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 so much, uh, Gwen. Uh, currently, I am utilizing the koozie to drink a um, a wonderful 11.6% uh, imperial dessert stout called tiramisu, which is brewed um, by a craft brewery called Blackbridge Brewery in Swift Current, Saskatchewan. So if you're ever in our fine province, make sure you check out Blackbridge. They're a great brewery. Okay. Back to it. Um, today's episode is a special mid-season interview episode with the inimitable Paul Zolo. Um, those of you who listen to the podcast regularly will recognize his name instantly as I reference that in every episode, um, the, the book Conversations with Tom Petty, uh, because it's it's got uh, an incredible wealth of information uh, about pretty much every song up to the last three albums, which are the only ones that, um, that aren't covered. Um, so, And if you haven't checked that book out, make sure you get your hands on it. Whether you do an ebook or you go pick a hard copy up, um, please go do that. And I'm thinking that toward the end of this episode, uh, sorry, toward the end of this season, um, I'm going to grab one of those books and I'll do another giveaway and I'll send that to someone so that you can um, that you can share my passion for digging into the music in, in, some, in some depth. Um, I hope that everyone's safe and healthy out there. Um, and rather than blather on too endlessly, why don't I just get you right into the conversation that I had with Paul a couple, three weeks ago, and I'll chat to you again at the end. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, my fine friends. Uh, welcome to the Tom Petty Project podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Brown. Um, I'm extremely honored and very happy to be joined tonight by Paul Zolo. Paul is an editor, a journalist, a writer, a singer, a songwriter, a musician, an author, and of course, most importantly to the Tom Petty community, the man who brought conversations with Tom Petty to all of us. Welcome to the podcast, Paul. Thank you very much, Kevin. Very happy to be here. I love to talk about Tom anytime, as I've told you. I'm finding that most people do. Whenever you ask, would you like to jump online and talk about Tom Petty? People say, yes, definitely. I think you have that effect on people, yeah, right? You know, of all people to write a book about him, and he was beloved with good reason. You know, he was such a great person and amazing, you know, musician over decades, but really a good person who cared about his fans more than most big rock stars, you know. Yeah, and, and and demonstrably too, right? I mean, he he went to the to the wall for his fans with hard promises, and again with you know different um in different avenues where he thought he wouldn't raise his ticket prices or he didn't want to didn't want to rip people off and wanted to make sure that anyone who wanted to come and see the Heartbreakers play could do that, which I think is you know maybe that is what exactly. endeared him to so many people. Yeah, because he always remembered he was that kid who wanted to go see shows, and he didn't want to, as he said, outprice his audience. That yeah, it was always the people, and he always kept that in mind. And he thought, you know, they were only raising his album. It was an LP, uh, one dollar. Yeah, I think it was from eight ninety eight to nine ninety eight. But he would have been the first of the artists. And he just figured they're going to think, you know, Tom wanted to do this, and he just didn't feel good about it. But so he fought it. But he assumed his peers would join him, and no one joined him. Yeah, it was just not a thing that people did was to fight the companies like that over, you know, they just usually just accepted that kind of stuff. But well, Tom yeah, did that, you know. Yeah, and I mean, even so far as you know, the last DJ, that's that's not a single yeah. act. That's a full album pushing back against. Well, you know, the first half of a full album pushing back against what he saw as, you know, corporate greed and and in, inauthenticity and those types of uh, things that have crept into music slowly and slowly. And I mean, my God, I think if he looked at it now, I don't know what he would think. You know, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm glad you brought that up. People don't often mention that, but because he has this reputation as this laid back, easygoing guy, everything's groovy. And he was not that. Yeah. In fact, his daughter said, you know, he told me that his daughter told told him that, Dad, you know, everyone thinks you're so laid back and like this cool hippie, and you are so not that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very concerned, but he just was so friendly. He felt that, you know, it seemed that way. But uh, many times he, he really fought for things. Uh, but the last DJ was unusual. I mean, that you'd write a whole album. Yeah. But it really, 
it, the purity of rock and roll and of radios, he grew up with it, mattered to Tom. That's what it was all about when we were yeah. growing up. You know, I grew up in America, eight years younger than him, but you know, I was part of you know listening to the radio and AM radio and the, remembering the Beatles when they first came to to our shores. Yeah, and uh, it was pretty exciting, you know, especially. In, you know, I was very young, but you know, we just had Kennedy just months before then. Boy, that was a good change. I mean, they they revitalized this country in such a way, and you know, obviously Tom, that was momentous for him. But uh, you know, when we were listening to radio, it's because the, the the songs we heard was because people liked them. They'd hear songs on the radio and they went and bought them. Yeah, and so it was democratic in some ways. And it, when that shifted, you know, when the DJs couldn't make their own choices about rock and roll, Tom. So, you know, we're losing the whole game here. We're, yeah. it's the, you know, it's the game. We're losing the, the mission. And uh, so, yeah, he spoke out. But at the same time, he also told me that, you know, it was meant as a metaphor for everything. You know, I use that one. But, you know, when people listen to rock and roll, they're not looking for metaphor, especially from Tom, but really from anyone. They're, oh, is yeah. that a metaphor? No, they just hear him. And they, I think they often assume it's 100% direct, you know, from, yeah. from how he feels. But he was writing about characters and, you know, he, he didn't want to denigrate anyone personally, but when we were doing our book, he he talked about being on certain festivals. He said with certain, they were female, they, they say they call them rock stars, you know, and yep. he didn't want to name by name. He said, huge sensation. And I was watching sound, you know, the sound check and they cannot sing, you know, and it's okay, call them pop stars, but please don't call them musicians because yep. they are not music. And that mattered to him. You know, it, it was all about purity to him. And when, you know, the, the biggest pop stars in this country started to become people that couldn't even sing on tune, you know, or play anything, or write songs. That's not what it was about for Tom. He held on to that purity of rock and roll, but it was one of the last ones. I mean, yeah, Stones are trying to go in, but... Uh, well, with, it, with a sense of humility about it too, right? And I think that's, again, something that is lacking at times. And I think maybe is what is one of the things certainly that endears tom to people is that he never came out and you know he would never have dreamed of doing what kanye did at glastonbury you know is it you are now listening to the greatest rock star on the planet oh come on dude really you don't even have a band <laughs> like get over yourself tom would i would never have even entered his head to do something like that right or that grandiose Not quite the opposite he puts himself down you know yeah he's saying you know, with my limited musical talent he goes i'm not really <laughs> even a musician but come on you're not a musician People, you would think that because he didn't technically know the names of, well, that would be a G minor six, you know, with yeah. that. But that didn't matter. You know, McCartney didn't necessarily know how to name the chords either, but he, you know, it's brilliant with chords and with melody. I mean, a brilliant songwriter. I mean, feel, right? I mean, it's, it's, you, you can feel, you know what, you don't know what the name of the chord is, but you know that it sounds perfect. So don't worry about it, what it's called. Yeah. And he said, even people that would learn our songs, they didn't get the voicings right. Because often it was him and Mike with two different things on the guitars and their yep. voices were always interesting. But he, he, it kind of bothered him too. He said, you know, people would often tell him that they, they thought it was easy what he did. It seemed easy. And he said, you know, if they think it's easy, they should try doing it. <laughs> well, you know, he worked so hard. He was so good at it that it seemed easy. Like the, the song seemed effortless, but the, sometimes they were, but you know, they were often the result of a lot of work and, and focus and diligence. Yeah, and, and a great example of that is the, the last episode that I did that was released today is Here Comes My Girl. That's a great example of it, right? So he gets this great guitar track from Mike and learns it off the, off the tape and, and sit there and he just, he's got the chorus, he's got that kind of figured out, has no idea what the hell to do with the verse. And then Ron Blair comes over and says, man, that's a, hell of a, that's a hell of a piece of music there. So he sticks with it and eventually that sort of falls to, okay, well, the narration will work there. And of course, like you said, I mean, for every wildflowers where lightning in a bottle just strikes and it comes out in one take, there's 20 Here Comes My Girls where you've really got to work out, well, where do we go with this? Where do we move it? How do we lift it? Are we putting too much in? Are we leaving too much out? You know? Right. But he keeps working it until it seems that it was, you know, that it was perfect. You know, you don't sense yeah. that at all when you Here Comes My Girl. And there's many of those, like You Wreck Me. Yeah. Took him a year. And he said he had You Rock. <laughs> yes. It's close, but. But he was really, he had his modular system of songwriting, as he called it, that every section of the song has to be equally good. And that's that kind of focus is why his songs sustain and they're so great over the years. I and mean, they had great melodies, you know, and he just wouldn't settle. If the bridge wasn't good enough, it didn't get in. If, if it didn't have a good intro. And and sometimes, it, you know, he'd work five, six hours just to get the bridge right, you know, but he yeah. would do it. He'd stay there. Sometimes he would complain about it, that it was lonely, <laughs> hard work. But he loved that more than anything. When I think, you know, once you see, and obviously because he'd done it so many times, 
once you see the product come out the other end, once you see the sort of the end result of, oh, well, actually, you know, I've, I've punched the wall and broken my hand and been told I'll never play again. But at the end of it, we we did get to where we needed to get to. And the same thing with Stan, right? You know, with, with the hours and hours on end hitting that snare drum and, nope, that's not right. Let's get a new head in. Let's bring a new thing. We'll have to retune it. Okay, yeah, but then you get refugee sounding like refugee sounds and it has to sound that way. Those are two examples Tom would find somewhat painful. I think Stan and breaking <laughs> Stan I guess oh, that one was like a little extreme. That's because he was on Coke and that was yep. kind of a sign that time to stop chewing Coke, you know, because he couldn't get it right. And yeah, you know, as he said in the book, he smashed his hand to powder. I mean, he really smashed his hand. And they they thought for sure he'd never play again. And it was really painful for yep. about a year. But he got it back, but that's awful that that happened, you know. Yep. Well, thank goodness. Stan, that- Thank goodness, though, that, you know, because some people don't manage to pull back from that from that cliff, right? I remember listening to George Carlin talking about that and saying that, you know, he was doing so much weed at one point that it was diminishing returns and he was doing more weed than writing jokes and the jokes weren't as good. So he sort of said, well, I've got to leave that now because it's interfering with what I actually love doing, which is writing right. jokes. And I think Tom probably must have been an epiphany to say, okay, well, that's probably a line that yeah. needs to be drawn in the sand there, right? Yeah. And, you know, people thought he was smoking pot all the time, but he didn't. He, he wouldn't smoke for, like, a, a session. Yeah. So maybe for, like, me listen to it afterwards, but he was a pro. You know, he really was. And that's why he did so much work. You know, I mean, he got a lot done. Yeah. You know, 40 years, you know, a short period of time. Well, uh, he, you know, when, he wasn't, when he wasn't with the Heartbreakers, he was making other albums or put together Mud Crutch. You know, he didn't want to stop. Yeah, I'm playing with touring with Dylan. I mean, for God's sakes. And that's the other thing that I always think with Tom that I get frustrated with when you when I'm talking to you know, quote unquote lay people who maybe don't know music very well or don't know Tom's music very well, is you know, yeah, he's a great songwriter and you know free falling, you know won't back down, you know the hits. Um, and he's you know, he's known as a songwriter, but a phenomenal musician on top of that, a great rhythm guitarist a massively underappreciated singer for me. And you don't get, you know, and the Heartbreakers too, brilliant music. You don't get to go play with Dylan on tour if you can't play because Dylan changes the frigging set every night. You've got to be on your tours. You've got to be able to react. Absolutely. I mean, to interrupt, yeah, but they're an amazing band. I mean, the Heartbreakers. Yeah. I mean, Ben Montage alone, Mike Campbell. I mean, those are two of the greatest musicians in rock and roll. Yeah. I mean, it was great. And losing, you know, getting, having to fire Stan wasn't easy for Tom, but he didn't want to always work with someone he was always fighting with. Yeah. He plays a great musician. And that was one reason he loved to write so much, too. Even during when they were doing Echo, which you know, was considered a very sad album. And it's sad. But he loved recording it. And he said, you know, he'd have so much fun. He just wanted to go home that night and you know, write another song so they, he had something to bring in the next day. Yeah. One of the reasons he loved so much, he just loved recording with those guys. But also, he didn't dictate to them at all. You know, they like a Room at the Top, you know, where like on the second verse, suddenly it, just you know, it, it comes in with big drums and huge guitar. Yep, that was them. You know, like Mike and uh, and Steve Brony just just felt that. Yeah, and Tom, you know, it's a very delicate song. Tom said, "I would have never thought that," and that's one reason. I mean, so that was real rock and roll. It was really playing with the band and discovering the song in the studio. And that's another reason why they could play with Dylan because that's what Dylan was all about. It wasn't about you know being Steely Dan. I mean, I love Steely Dan, <laughs> but that's not, I, I really do. But it's not that you know. Yeah. It's more. You know, rock and roll I mean. but uh but you know tom loved that too it was a huge honor to tom but dylan wanted to do more and tom felt that he had to go back you know yeah yeah that was a, a big deal for tom to say no to bob dylan now I've, I've had enough of you bob like, <laughs> can you imagine like, <laughs> it's like dave, yeah, dave Grohl, when dave Grohl said the same thing to tom right after the snl gig when he said you know you, you've got the gig if you want it like how do you say no to tom petty it's the same level of i don't know if this is the right decision you know yeah, you're right. But um, but you got yeah. the heart. You got the heartbreaks to go back to. So I suppose really it's a it's a no lose situation, well, isn't it? It was a long time, and uh, but it was great for them too. It, it was funny, you know. Sometimes Dylan he said would well, just just to mess with them would throw out a song that no one knew, like an Ink Spot song, right? And Tom, no one knows it except Benmont, of course. And then Benmont <laughs> he played anything immediately. You know, he's one of the guys. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, and he, like that. he couldn't throw Benmont. Yeah, but, well, but also Dylan had a famous like crisis of confidence during that that he, he spoke of it. Seeing Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers for Dylan was daunting. Yeah, and you know it was in Sweden that he had kind of a breakdown. Like I can't do this. I don't know how to do this anymore. You guys got it down. You know, so Tom, could, Tom was really surprised. By that. Well, and I think it's, I think it's in the book where he, he yeah. says, or in an interview where he says that 
Dylan said they're, they're coming to see you, not me. You know, which again, as as petty, you think, oh my god, well, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think that was true at all. I, no, I mean they were coming to see both. <laughs> yeah, I went. You did? Did you see? It must have been very no, young. No, I, I would have been too young, and I I didn't get into petty until like deeply into Tom Petty until I would say about six or seven years ago. So of course, timing wise, it was bad because I didn't get to see him play live, but I did get you know, 20 albums to just go and binge off and get into a huge catalogue of work, so. That's the great thing that he left us, such good work. But so, I mean, you got the albums, that's him, you know, I mean, he yeah. put everything in those albums. He didn't, there's not one of them that's kind of filler or he didn't, wasn't fully engaged, you know. Not at all, and we were talking, I was talking with a, a guest on season one, uh, Dallas Helliker, about this. We were saying that when you look at the arc, you know, most bands, most artists, when they get to the 60s, the big rock acts, they tend to sort of plateau and they'll go and do it. It really becomes a sort of a greatest hits tour and that's fine because they still love the songs and the mm -hmm. fans still love hearing them, but Mojo yeah, and Hi Hypnotic Eye. Hypnotic Eye is a band that's growing upwards. That's a band that's not even reached its pinnacle yet for me because that album is just absolutely stunning from, from, front, to, from front to back. Absolutely amazing. Well, thank you for mentioning it. Yeah, I think I agree. I love, I love that. Uh, Fault Lines, that song, and uh, oh. American Dream Part B. That's yeah. quite a song. No, and well, in Fault Lines is, I think, you know, you're talking about the contribution of the other band members. That drum part that Steve Ferroni plays on that song with that kind of, it's almost like a little bossa nova that, that he's playing on the ride, but it's got the big crash, you know, it's got the big sort of sound on the on the, on the on the kick drum. Just absolutely perfect. And I don't know, obviously, I'd, well, I don't think Mike or Tom ever demoed drums. So that would have been Steve come sitting and listening to that riff and thinking, yeah, this is the way to play this. And I'll just add this little bit of Latin flair into it too, by the way. Yeah, no. it you know, they did different takes, and they might, but but yeah. Brony had a great. Tom said at first they they just kept telling him play less. I mean, they don't have to play. <laughs> they really want it simple, you know, especially after I think Stan. Yeah, but Ferroni's great. It was he's so great. He was there for decades, and they they never quite accepted him. He was always the new guy, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, that's his nickname. Yeah, old fans kind of resented him in some way. I mean, they love him, but that's so funny though. I always find that strange when when fans take a, a side against you know either someone leaving a band or joining a band like you're, you're not in the room like you don't you don't know what's going on like you know the band the band yeah. knows trust that it's the band's decision and it's the best for everyone right so and it's not like yeah. stan it's not like stan left and did nothing else ever after he had a great career after that right so did he i don't know that much about what he did afterward but it definitely wasn't easy for tom to do that none, none of yeah. those kind of things that tom were easy he really cared about people like when Howie got sick and yeah. uh, you know had problems with her, Tom took that so deeply. You know, he wasn't one of those guys like he's out of here. Gotta give me another bass player. You know, yeah. by any means. It's not Billy Joel. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to just kind of dig back a little bit um, before we got on and on our emails. You, you said that obviously you live in LA and you've been there for a long time now, but you grew up in Chicago, right? Yes. So what was what was the, what was your childhood like? I was in the suburbs, which was very idyllic, but, but very close to, you know, the city. And I, you know, I love music more than anything. I remember when the Beatles first came on the radio in 64. Yeah. It, was, it just sounded different. I was listening to it. Now, those voices together, you know, and I want to hold your hand. They're the harmonies, and the minor chords, you know. Yeah. Wow. And then they were on radio a lot, you know. We were always listening to those little tiny transistors. So that was, music seemed so exciting immediately. And I got obsessed also with uh, Simon and Garfunkel. Right. I just love something like Garfunkel. And I started playing guitar like around 10 and writing songs immediately, imitating Paul Simon. I was just really into Simon. And uh, you know, later I got obsessed with Dylan. And I liked him, but I didn't really understand him as a kid. But <laughs> And Beatles, too, obviously. They, well, not obvious, but they were huge Beatles. But also, my dad was really into folk music, Pete Seeger. Yeah. And, you know, the message of folk music. And, the and so I was raised on that and Woody Guthrie and that, too. So. I loved all kinds. I mean, my mom loved standards, you know, all those songs that Sinatra sang. Right. And then, and so I studied piano, and I just loved all kinds of songs. But I was drawn to rock and roll mostly, and uh, and writing my own songs. And my, my first yeah. songs were, I was like ten, but I was imitating other songs. But that's how everyone starts. Oh, of course, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you you don't have a you don't have any experience to draw from when you're ten years old, eleven years old, right? Exactly. There's, there's... You got to imitate. Yeah. Yeah. If you see your singer, all songwriters are links in a chain. That's true. No one starts in a vacuum. You know, you've heard some music. That's why you want to do it, right? There's something yeah. you heard that. But uh, I was in college. I went to college at Boston University when I first heard Tom. I remember my girlfriend was really into him. Springsteen was pretty new then too. He was just kind of emerging, and 
Elvis Costello. I didn't necessarily trust those guys, right? but I first saw Elvis Costello. <laughs> he didn't look like a rocker to me, you know. I grew to you know love him, but but you first heard Tom, you know, and look, some people's like, yeah, that's really good, but we is he just imitating? Is he trying to sound like Roger McGuinn? He's kind of like Dylan. Yeah. But then another great song, and then you know, it's like he he did so many great songs. We I figured he'd probably peak, you know, after two years of that with all those MTV hits. Yep, they had so many. But he just kept going, and uh, it was remarkable. You know, I knew he was good, but then it just it it's really became remarkable with the reinvention of Full Moon Fever, and that wasn't easy either to leave his band. You know, yep. even temporarily, that was a big deal for him. But but sonically and musically, and the the joy and simplicity that he found in those songs, and from there on in, because he learned a new way of recording too, which helped. You know, yep. recording was really kind of torturous for him prior to that, and. Uh, and you know, then that was just so remarkable up to Full Moon Fever and then Wildflowers. And <laughs> that's when I first interviewed them. They sent me just a uh, dance, it was on cassette tape at the time. I'd be riding my bike through Griffith Park in Los Angeles, listening, not knowing what's on this. And it's like, well, that's a, that's, that's a great song. That's, it's like, well, it's so many great songs because overflowing with songs during yep. Wildflowers, which I learned later. You know, his marriage was already falling apart, he was still living in Encino with, with Jane. And that's when I first met him, though. I didn't see her, but. He was in a great mood, you know. I first met him, so uh, I interviewed him. It was for Song Talk magazine. I was interviewing. A, it was the Journal of the National Academy of Songwriters. It was on newsprint originally, and then uh, I interviewed. You know, tried to interview all the great songwriters, but really about songwriting because I'm a songwriter yeah. myself, and I had a band, and I, you know, and, and uh, I'd interviewed Dylan prior to that, and Tom noticed that one, and I went backstage at a show that he was at the Troubadour is a folk show that he was doing with the Roger McGuinn okay. at UCLA. And uh, some people, you go right up to him backstage, that does, that's not cool. But that was cool, you know. And also, I think he could sense that I was okay. But uh, he, had, he, had, he had read the Dylan interview, and I asked him if he'd consider doing an interview. And he said, yeah, absolutely. And Mary Clouser was his, uh, one of his two managers for 40 years. Yeah. was right there, and he told her to set it up. And sometimes they say that the managers don't set it up. You know, they go, sure, but... But, but Mary was always so cool. And so she set it up, and that was my first interview with him. And then I interviewed him many times after that for different things. And uh, and then I kind of, kind of came up with the idea of doing a book. And at the time, there just there hadn't been any books about him. Yeah. And people wanted a book, so it was good timing. And uh, so we, we did the book, and, the, and we got together every Saturday for over a year, uh, for a couple of hours, meet around noon, because that's when he would get up. He was just getting up. Yeah. He was <laughs> He'd be real sleepy, but he was always cool. You know, he never once was like in a bad mood or anything. It was great. And I think, was, you know, was, wow. just as a songwriter yourself, and I mean, I'm a hobbyist songwriter, having access to one of your songwriting heroes to dig into the, to really nerd out about the music itself and not, not bothered about the stories from the road and meeting this person, that person, but just, okay, why did you use that snare sound there? Why did you drop the bass out in this section? To be able to ask those questions, that's just a dream come true. So do you remember the first session you went to? Obviously you'd met him a few times and interviewed him, you know, multiple times, but that first session, knowing that you're, you're going down this road now and it's going to be a bigger project. How did you feel that first session? How did it go? Joyful. Tom was a joyful guy. There were yeah. some people I'd meet with and you could sense they were nervous. I won't name names, but they were, they were nervous. Yeah. They were comfortable and didn't necessarily trust me. He was in a good, he was in a good mood. I did interview him, you know, during his sad period after he left Jane, uh, when he was living at the chicken shack and he wasn't like that at all. It was like he was gone. But yeah. uh, during the wildflowers and he was in a great, great mood. And after that, when we did the book, he was in a great mood. But, uh, he was an easy person to talk to. Some other people that are more guarded. Yeah. And I mean, he already knew that I had a great respect for songwriters. I interviewed Paul Simon at great length. And th those were what my interviews were, like you mentioned, where I could get into those things. And, and you know, I was doing it for myself, just like you would, as, as much yeah. as for the people that love those people too. But, you know, that bridge, you know, did you did you come up with that chord? I mean, but songwriters still really <laughs> get that chance to talk about. Uh, and then you went to the B minor, you know? And, yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah and, was so much of their genius is and he loved that i reverse engineered all the songs as we well i knew the chords you know yeah, and, I yeah, yeah. Song. and i remember the first time i told him to learn he goes hey learn all the songs and, and <laughs> I love that because they're you know as you probably know I, i'm sure you know they're deceptively simple a lot of them but they're not necessarily simple at all the way he uses chords and no, almost always they sir yeah not at all i mean 
Go ahead, sorry. Quarter, another, there's, there's usually one chord, you know, not many that that shouldn't be there, you know, but he uses it in a brilliant way, you know. So he's he's kind of ingenious with it. I mean, absolutely ingenious. And all of them too. I mean, Mike and, and, and Ron as well. And I, there's a bit in that I only noticed because, you know, with the podcast, I sit and really, same thing you would have done, really listen to the songs. Now I'm just listening to the bass. Now I'm just listening to the drums. Now I might just only be listening to the snare. I might only listen to the kick. And there's a bit in, I think it's in the bridge in Here Comes My Girl, where they're playing still, they're playing those suspended chords, but Ron is playing an arpeggio uh, in, the, in a straight major. And he's not playing the same, it's not the same chord that everyone else is playing. And when you hear it, it's like that is so frigging clever, because it gives the it gives such a sonic width to that little section that mm. you just wouldn't have if you didn't have that that you know that third note coming in because they're not no one else. Everyone else, Ben Mont's playing first and fifth, and the other guys are playing their suspended chords, and Ron sits in with the one three five in the chord progression. It's just so cool. And when you notice those little things like that, and and you notice at least one of those things in every single song, there's something like that in every single song. Certainly so far that I've noticed. Yeah, I mean the production was always nice, but tasteful too. It would yep. overload. There'd be bits of that, you know, and like you know, certain guitar sounds that that, that Mike would use, and you know, his slide playing on certain places. And, yep. Yeah, Tom played uh, played drums pretty well. He played on Highway Companion. He played all the drums, which he recorded at home. Yep. But he's humble about that. He goes, "I couldn't play live. You know, I'm not a great drummer, but I could do it at home because you could fix it." But that's pretty good, you know. Not oh. there's not many guitar players I know that can play drums. I can't play. Drums. <laughs> I don't know how to do those. Yeah. Well, so, as you said, like when to, coming into this, writing this book and this project, there weren't any other Tom Petty, there was no biography out there. You know, we didn't have YouTube back then, so you couldn't sort of research that way. How did you, what sort of research did you do um, other than listening to the songs? Because obviously you did get into a little bit of his life because you found out that you, you definitely needed that context to explain some of those musical directions that he, he found. So what sort of, what was your research process for something like that? Well, back then, yeah, it was harder to do research, but I'd go to the library and, you know, you'd, there'd be like magazine stories, Rolling Stone would have interviews, uh, TV shows. No, actually, I couldn't find TV shows. That was later. But I guess it's mostly magazine stories. I was just thinking, I was reading the book, like, where did I get that information from? Because it's so <laughs> much easier now. Of course, a lot that you get nowadays might not be valid at all. You know, it has to be a, a good source, but because uh, there's so much there. But I did as much as I could. You know, I'd get interviews, and but there was a lot I didn't know about. Like the the thing of the thing about his uh his uh, grandfather killing a guy. That was the reason they had to move from Georgia. I th I just heard that like a, as a rumor, but I wasn't sure that was true. So sometimes I would just dish around. Like, is that even true? I I, I expected that wasn't. I was yeah. surprised. Such a cool we story, though. Yeah. We didn't plan originally to talk about his life at all. The original plan was we're just going to play music in all the songs, even the non, the ones that were not official albums, the ones yeah. that were on, you know, the anthology and stuff. But, but his, his, his life and his, his music were intertwined. And stories like that were so cool. I mean, that story is a, it's because his grandfather, Pulpwood Petty, he was called that because he worked at the logging place, you know, like, yeah. at, married a full-blooded Cherokee woman, Tom's grandmother. <laughs> and that wasn't, in America, can you imagine that they didn't like I, that? For, for, no, it wasn't. And people got really upset. And Tom, and I guess there was something, you know, they were trying to leave, and, and Tom said something happened, and his grandfather ended up killing a guy. <laughs> it's like that. And <laughs> I thought it was weird. Tom said, no, his dad told him that story late in life. But that's quite a story. Well, again, it, it does, it ties in, right? Because Pulpwood shows up in US 41. From Mojo, that's you know, Grandpa's name was was Pulpwood, and you know, without any sort of context, that you think, well, that's a really odd handle to just kind of pluck out of there. Why would you call your character in this song Pulpwood? It's not even a name. But well, no, if you know the story, there's a little homage back to Granddad there, right? So yeah, I think there's a lot of those that we probably don't know. That you're right, Pulpwood. It's an odd name. I didn't understand it for the long time. <laughs> it was just worked with the longing place, Pulpwood. Oh, Pulpwood Petty. Yeah, he also had many earls. His dad was an earl, and his middle name was Earl. And yeah, had like five uncle earls, and then I guess his grandmother wouldn't speak the name Earl for some reason. It's really strange. <laughs> <laughs> and so you said one of the things you said in the book too that um, I, I found sort of interesting was that you were taken off guard a little bit with how much you could feel the intensity of his emotions. So, and I wonder, I've asked. I thought about that asking other people. I think I asked John Scott this. Do you think he ever really sort of understood that effect that he had on people? You know, because Elvis, obviously, it was very visceral and physical, the, the effect that he had on, on, especially on women. 
But Tom's effect on people, I don't know whether he, obviously he could hear the crowd cheering, but that sort of magnetism that you have with another human being sometimes, which you can't really define, you can't predict. Do you think he ever sort of understood that he had that effect on people? Yeah, I think he did because he was liked by everyone, you know, whether it was Roy Orbison or Dylan or, you know, George Harrison or the Beatles. Yeah. I mean, the royalty of rock and roll, they loved Tom, you know. They, they didn't love every young rocker like Tom, but yeah. he was one of those guys, you know, because he, he was real. I think that was it, but... Uh... Yeah, cool. It's, it, when you get into the book, like I said, people who, who don't write songs probably don't grasp how sort of the balance tips one way or another with a, a sort of a creative decision here or there. You know, we, we, if um, if this doesn't work, we'll try this. Oh, and that just takes the song in an entirely different direction. And I think what the book does a brilliant job of is, among other things, is shining a light on, on that process, but in an interesting way. It's not a dry way. So it really is sort of a geek, a music geek book for lay people. And that's how I sort of think of it. You know, there's some pretty technical stuff in there, but you never get bogged yeah. down in it. And it, you know, it, it, that sort of, that approach genuinely helped me shape how I was going to go about my podcast. Because so I thought, you know, I can go really technical on the musical side, but you, I probably need to talk about the song and the background to the song and Tom himself and add a little bit of colouring because I don't think anyone's going to want to listen to, you know, oh, listen to those two rhythm parts. They're completely out of phase. And so this means that, blah, blah, you know, there's only so far you can go with that. So I really appreciated that you sort of, I heard your voice through the book as well. So it sort of it took away some of that dryness. So was that a deliberate sort of conscious thing when you were compiling that afterwards to sort of make it flow so that it wasn't all really technical sort of, you know, studio-based stuff? Absolutely. I mean, I think there's actually as much about songwriting, the writing is, if not more, as the record making. Yeah. I don't really get too technical, but it's a, it's a concern I have. I mean, most of my work is interviewing songwriters. I mean, I did a whole book. I just happen to have it here. So yeah. I'm not over this either. Songwriters on songwriting. Yeah. And you know, I got Dylan and Simon and uh, you know early guys like uh, Sammy Kahn and and, and uh, Tom is in this book. A different interview than that's uh, from the first time. But that's what that is. It's because uh, like we were saying, I'm a songwriter and I really wanted to talk about music as well as how it all goes together. Because as you know, it's not just the words. It's not just the title or the the hook. It's there's many many aspects of a song yeah, and how they all go together, that balance. That's what it's all about. Simon called it the crucial balance. You can have an amazing melody, but, you know, Tom Petty's words, you know, have so much resonance and beauty, but you can have words that great without a great melody, but he always said melodic songs. I mean, his songs were melodic, whether yep. they rocked or not. Yeah, 100%. And, melody, you know? and yet they were cool melodies. They weren't like small C melodies, you know, and, yep. and, and he was—he just knew simple, like uh, fundamental things. Like I said, you know, how how do you know if you got a good melody? And he goes, well, for example, like, can you hum it? If you can't, that's <laughs> not, okay. he goes, simple things like that. Or he said, uh, sometimes people will come up and they'll go, "Time, you got to hear this new song I wrote. It's got a chord progression you've never heard. This one yeah. chord you've never heard." And Tom will listen to it. He goes, "You know why you've never heard that chord? That doesn't sound good at all. Take that chord out." <laughs> <laughs> and he, in other words, it's not for me, fellow musicians, like to be impressed. It's like, does it sound good or not? And Tom always knew that. You know, he always was able to keep fans in mind. Where I think some rock stars, they just get so uh, engulfed in that yeah. they don't even beyond their their kingdoms. You know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it, it's sort of that. I've talked about this before on on, on episodes where when you get that level of songwriter, you can write a great rock song and it's a straight out, you know, it's not even, we've gone past rock and roll now. There's no roll anymore. It's just a hard rocking song, but then can also write the best pop song you've ever heard with a, with, with a hook and a great melody that has been played on radio for 30, 40 years. American Girl will be being played 50 years from now. And that's a great rock song, but it's also a great pop song because it's got that hook and it's got that thing that it's got that earworm. Yeah. And you could, like you said, you can hum it. You know, you can hum that melody. I never, I've got a friend, my, my, well, my friend I was talking about who he likes his jazz and he likes a lot of funk. But again, to me, I, I like watching people play it, but I'm never going to just listen to it because I can't find, I can't, again, I can't find that hook. I can't find the melody. And maybe it's just, I have a lack of sophistication, but I, I need yeah. something. I need, I need that melody. I need that line that I can hum. I need something to take away, you know? Me too. They're real songs. You know, so often nowadays I'll hear a hit song and, it's an interesting record. It's got a lot of interesting sonics, but is it a song? You know, Tom's a real yeah. song. You know, there's the bridge, there's the intro. And 
there's development to the you know the, the structure every, every bit of it is beautifully done yeah but so well done that you don't even notice how how you know how well you know written it is you know it just seems yeah. right some some other songs you know like great songs by like a dylan or john lennon i am the walrus it's like yeah that's a genius you can tell but yeah tom's not like that you know well, but, but he, you know, genius is 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 there but it's not so overt but I mean, I think he he still had those those arrows in his quiver, right? He just didn't pull them out oh, as yeah. often. He just he just because I think when you mingle them in very sparsely, they have more impact then, right? Because it's not you're not sounding everything's yeah. not sounding the same. Yeah, when he goes like rebel and you're abandoned, you know, like suddenly oh. there's like this almost Shakespearean right in the middle of rock and roll. <laughs> but but he did it in a way. I don't mean that that he was. I think that it is in a way that's greater to do that. You don't want a song to sound like. I mean, Dylan or Lennon, I mean, they, they, they were amazing, but you don't want a song to sound like it. You, you took a lot of work or was, yeah. you know, Tom songs made you feel good, you know, whether they rocked or not. They just, they were right. You know, they just are, are classic songs. And it's great that when someone does that, but he really kept, really kept a focus on it. Some people used to, you know, did that at one time and kind of lost their ability yeah. to do it. Well, it's, it's like you said earlier, it's the, there's the genius side of, an artist like Tom Petty, but there's also the the work and the diligence and the attention to detail, right? It's the same thing, you know, when people talk about Einstein, they always talk about what a genius he was. Well, yeah, Einstein also worked twice as hard as everyone else in his field. And that's why, that's as, as much why he was as brilliant as he was as his natural God-given ability. And it's exactly the same with Petty because like you said, I mean, he, he was a student of music. He, you know, I love that. There's a story, and I think it's in, again, in, in the book where he's on about, um, the only thing he wanted for his birthday was to be left alone for as long as he wanted in the record store because everyone always wants to leave after an hour and that's not long enough. And so again, that's, you know, just listening to absorbing music and listening to music and being absolutely obsessed with it. That was later in life. That wasn't when he was a kid. That was yeah. like with, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was an amoeba in Hollywood. But then he got to go back and he told me, uh, about it. he got like boxes of albums. <laughs> he, got so many. he like bought a library of albums. He just yeah. loved music. Well, and there's something, there's something very special about vinyl. You know, my, my youngest daughter, who's now 15, two years ago, asked my wife and I for a, for a turntable, just out of the blue, which is quite tactile. She reads books rather than e-reader. Um, so yeah. she got back into vinyl. So I've got back into vinyl now. So I, have, I now have my turntable. And I haven't had one for years and years and years. So getting back and listening to, you know, the Heartbreakers albums and some of those mono Bob Dylan records, they're just, they just sound different, man. They really do. Yeah, yeah I just put a new uh, turntable and I moved into this this house and, it's nice. I've been listening to it for the first time in a while. So Sweet. many people are like, yeah, I'm listening to CDs now because I guess we have to, but we could still do that. It's legal. <laughs> <laughs> At first I was like, it's going to be so much work, you know, like I did that a million times when I was yeah. a kid. I used to live in my LP. That's all I did was listen to records. That's what yeah, I wasn't trying to learn but that's the other thing too. There's, you know, as growing up, we didn't have tape cassettes. Tape cassettes came in when I was a kid. I remember having getting my first, you know, the huge ass single tape deck brick thing that was heavy as anything. But so we used to listen to vinyl, and I think one of the things that is a little bit different nowadays is people don't listen to, and so a lot of people don't necessarily have to write albums. You write two or three hit songs, and then some filler, and hopefully there's a couple of decent sort of deep cuts, but it doesn't really matter because no one's listened to the album where with vinyl, I sit down, I put on Wildflowers, and I listen to Wildflowers. I put on the wall, I listen to the wall. I put on, I, uh, I listen to the whole album because you, that's the way you're supposed to listen to this music. You're not supposed to pick and choose, really, right? I totally agree. I miss that, too. And also with LPs, there was Act 1 and Act 2. There was an intermission, you had to turn it over. And so the the first song of side two, that was a big deal. You know, the side two yeah. was really tough. And that's why Tom is, I'm sure, you know, like on, I guess the first album of his was Full Moon Fever that was on CD and he made a little announcement. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is what you normally would get up and turn over the yeah. album. With. Like, yeah, do that. It's so funny to him. It's so cool though, and, right? That's just such a neat little thing to add in. And it again, shows his sort of, I think his playful side and his sense of humor that, you know, just don't take it so seriously, you know? <laughs> Yeah, and he was playful, and he was very funny. Anytime we'd meet, he'd always have his funny clothes on. He'd always have a different <laughs> outfit. And sometimes he's weird, like suits, like from the forties. And he, he'd be like, "Can you believe someone would even wear this?" I would just be to, to be funny, you know, <laughs> funny like hats and glasses and slippers and stuff. It was cool. Yeah. Well, there's the famous photo of him with the, you know, the glasses with the eyebrows and the mustache. You know, it's kind of like the Groucho thing, but I, think, I can't remember which album that's on. 
think Long After Dark, maybe? I think it's on the inner sleeve from Long After Dark, or maybe Hard Promises. It's one of those two. Um, so one thing, again, I was going to talk about the style that you took in the book. One thing that I love is the use of italics in the book to emphasize certain words and, and it kind of gives you, you, you hear it more in Tom's voice than just a written word on the page. Um, and it really brings that voice to life, to life and you can hear him narrating it. So again, just, uh, just to get into some sort of process geek stuff, just for myself, really, maybe we'll even cut this out at the edit. I don't know. But again, was that a deliberate thing? We thought that he, he said he's put, he's put emphasis on that word. So I need to put emphasis on that word. Absolutely. I mean, that's always the challenge when you do these, conversations in in print yeah and now i'm using some of the audio you can hear in podcasts or do this but it was for print and i really wanted i was really wanted to get the sense of them and they also would put anytime there's laughter whether it just says laughs just yeah. the guy laugh laughter is where we both laugh i mean that's kind of what i meant yeah but it makes a difference you know when this person's laughing you know it changes the whole whole thing you know and for sure and also the italics you know and yeah, and also putting them into paragraphs where they're kind of readable. But I try to make it so you could read it but get a sense of him. It's kind of strange. They did an audible version of the book recently. Oh, and really? Jim Mess yes. And uh, without I, I had nothing to do with it. But uh, they hired this guy, Jim Meskimen, to do both my voice and Tom's voice. But for Tom's voice, he really did a character. He really got into doing Tom. But with mine, it's just flat. So it sounds kind of like a psychiatrist asking <laughs> And then was your mother always enjoying it? <laughs> like, no, it seemed creepy. You know, most of the stuff was like more humorous. And, oh my god, that's hilarious! Or why they couldn't maybe get two people to do it? You know, yeah, since it's two people talking with them. I was. It's funny you said that because I was literally as I was sort of prepping for tonight. I I was thinking about that. I was thinking, yeah, you, this is a book that wouldn't work as an audio book because you would need Tom Petty to read it, and even. That would be so weird and awkward him for to, for him to read it because what he's saying to you is off the cuff and it's spontaneous and he's it's not scripted so it wouldn't come across the same way twice you know that's right and I have I have the, I have the recordings of all that but it wasn't ex exactly you know yeah as, as it was and there was actually after I finished the whole manuscript that he didn't really want everyone to know it he went through it and he changed a few things you know and that was yep. okay to do yeah he didn't really need everyone to know that but it also showed what a pro he was he went through every line of the book. Well, I won't name names, but I've done books with people where they didn't even read their own book. <laughs> like, Come on, this is your your book, your name is on it, but not Tom. You know, he yeah. read every word. And, well, and I, also, there's certain things he considered, he reconsidered. There's, he told me long stories about how it, it was tough to be uh, so famous, and he'd go out just to pick up food with the uh, uh, with Dana uh, in Malibu, and. Uh, He'd have a hat on and glasses, but someone might see. You know, she would go in and someone, oh, fuck, it's Tom Petty, dude. Yeah. It, it would turn into a mob scene, and it would get scary. Yeah. And that's what happened to John Lennon and then to George Harrison, who he was very close with. He had a good reason to be scared. Absolutely, absolutely. So that, there was that, yeah. It's that weird so, thing, too, but, that I, I think that's – sorry, I, but I think that fans – sometimes, and I don't think tr I don't think like true fans ever do this, but I think fans sometimes think that they have – they, they deserve access to the individual where really all that Tom Petty owes you is exactly what he gave you is a, a, a catalog of phenomenal songs, great performances, some music videos, these types of things, and then collaborations on, on books that he was sort of was okay with doing beyond that. Right. You're owed nothing. You, you don't, you don't, so, you, know, you, you know, I agree. He gives more like great quality songs than most people ever get 40 oh, solid right. years of great songs, but yeah, but, uh, you know, it became difficult for him at times. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, he didn't cut himself off. Like in his later years, uh, like my son, when he was young, would get autographs of you know, famous people. And Tom would go out and meet the crowds, you know. And Yeah. And But but the point of, that I was trying to make was that he, he we had a whole like, day where we talked about that, a few hours. And so I wrote about it in the book. And he says, let's take that out. No one wants to hear me complain about being a rock star. <laughs> I thought that was, that was interesting. Yeah. He didn't want to like you know that you know made him look like he's complaining oh i'm so rich and famous and so already you know yeah. i like that about well, I, I always think that's interesting especially with rock stars the public persona that they choose to present to the world you know and again i'll go back to you. dave grohl's you know famously knows the nicest guy in rock and you'll get some people who say well yeah he's just putting on an act but I sometimes my counter to that sometimes is okay but i'd rather someone put on 
an act of positivity than an act of being an asshole because we've got plenty of assholes in the world. We need more positive people. And I know that obviously being a, a positive person wasn't an act for Tom, but again, I think being no, I sort of, you. you know being selective about the way you put yourself across. I think that's a, a cool thing. That's a, that's a good thing to do. Yeah, I think Tom realized that too. And how you're going to be remembered. Yeah, he made a point of you know it was about purity. You know, it's just sad in the way that he mentioned David Grohl because I, I remember see, we saw him at the at Tom's very last show at the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah, of course we know at the time. But my I was with my son who must have been 18 or so then, and uh, he's like Dave Grohl, you know. And so we went, we were talking to him as we were walking, and, and Dave, I just like all of us, it was just such a great show. We're just buzzing with the excitement. And, yeah. Now I'm very sad. You know, it was his last show. But what a way to go out, though, too, right? I mean, if you, if you to go out on that concert, you know, with yeah. the, the shout out to John Scott and so many people who had been part of his life in different ways there in attendance, at least everyone had that to end on, right? Rather than yeah. some bleak way of going out, went, you know? Absolutely. He went out on top. He finished that tour. I mean, he was in terrible pain, wasn't yeah. young doing it. It's the longest tour, I think, of any tour. It's a long tour. Yeah. Uh, and he finished it. And that last show was, I mean, I've seen many, many shows. And it was like a party. Yeah. It almost seemed like he was drunk. Like, was, is Tom Petty drunk? He was like, <laughs> you know, but you know, he gets, you know. Yeah. He was in such a good mood. And I, was, I got to take photos uh, just for the first few songs in the, you know, it was at the Hollywood Bowl, at the orchestra pit, right on oh, the stage. Nice. I didn't know that. Yeah. And, uh, and most of the, the photographers and the press came the first night. He did three nights. But my son and I wanted to be at the last show. It's good that we were. So there was one other guy maybe in the pit with me. So Tom saw me. And he came right over. And he stood right in front of me. And I was so startled. I didn't focus. I didn't get in focus. First <laughs> shot. But he must have come four times. And then I gave me the shot. So, so cool, in the new man. version of my book, I have one of those shots. And he just was grinning. He looked so happy. It was yeah. during his first time. But Dana saw those pictures. And she said, he knew it was you, and he kept coming back. <laughs> but it's like a photographer's dream. They stood right in front of me and just was still yeah. playing this game. And I think Mike Campbell's probably soloing at the time. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, again, I mean, it, it speaks to his character, you know, and his, his sort of his warmth of, of generosity. It's the same thing with reforming Mud Crutch. Tom Petty doesn't need to go and do that. He doesn't need to reform an old band with his old friends and go play 500 seaters because he's tom petty he can fill stadiums you don't need to do that but that sort of again that authenticity about everything that he did and his, his generosity to his friends and the people close to him it comes through pretty much everything he does and the story after story after story like that i think right yeah and there's stories that people don't know too or stories that are coming out yeah i guess rock rock mcguinn's great guitar was stolen Jerry about that is great the poster rick and backer no nope. And Tom says, Rick and Backer, not Rick and Bacher, Rick and Backer. Yeah. Uh, it was stolen. It was 12 string that gave that great bird sound. And uh, it was on the black market. It must have been like 60 grand or so. And Tom secretly bought it and gave it to him for Christmas. But oh. he didn't want anyone to know. I mean, who does that? Yeah, I mean, that's was, just, yeah. just incredible. And the same thing with, yeah. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I mean, it's, it's, it's again, when you're, when you're at that level of, stardom for whatever that whatever that means um and you're such a talent you could forgive someone for getting carried away with themselves i think um but it just seems that he didn't have that gene he never had that sort of that swaggery sort of arrogant i'm tom petty fuck you you know he just didn't it didn't exist from everything i've read and everyone i've spoken to about him it's true even when he was young he wasn't doing it just to get the chicks he was wanting to play music he liked getting pretty girls but it was about the music more than anything you know, yeah, it was always that way, right? and it was pure. He learned early on we should do this with purity. And the records he liked from early blues, rock and roll, real time rock and roll musicians playing together, good songs, good songwriting. Yep. And he took the whole thing very seriously, and rock and roll itself seriously. And he was upset, like you know, the last DJ when he he saw it getting diluted. It meant a lot to him. You know, it changed his life. You know, he saw it yep. obviously as a, for him alone. It changed his life in such a you know profound way, but. I mean everything, but he, and that's why and that's why he was always so connected with his fans because, you know, rock and roll changed his, his world in such a big way. You know, he was able to realize his dreams, and and you know it was funny when he started to do them. His mother wouldn't even she couldn't even accept it. You know, <laughs> yeah. he made a hundred dollars. You know, like because he when he was first playing with his early bands in, uh, in Gainesville, he made a hundred dollars. Uh, 
and his mother found it in his pants and said, <laughs> what is this? He said, I made that thing. And she would not believe it. She had to call the club and find out yeah. if it was true. She couldn't accept he made a hundred. That was a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And she goes, Tommy, you never had lessons. You know, how did you, even how he could write songs? It's just, you know, his dad kind of accepted it, but her, his mother just kind of, <laughs> it's just hard to believe. Yeah. Hey, man, it was a lot, he was a lot of talent as well. There was a lot of money so, back then. There's a lot of money these days for live acts in some cases. <laughs> like, the live music industry is not doing well. So, um, right. Not many great bands. And they were a real band. Yeah, for sure. And it, there's nothing like seeing a real band. Even if you don't know them, going into a, just randomly going into a bar on a Saturday night and saying, holy shit, who are these guys? This is fantastic. It just, and the same thing, like you said, you know, you said earlier on that when you listened to music, you knew that rock and roll was for you. And I remember viscerally listening to Black Dog, putting on side one of Zep 4 and thinking, whoa, this is for me. This is the music I want to listen to. I don't know what this is, but this is what I want to listen to. And just being taken away from it, taken away by it, you know. Yeah, I was just feeling that watching, you know, the, the new version of Let It Be, Get Back. Oh. Watching that many times, of the, especially where they're playing on the roof. And just remember how exciting it is. And it's like, there's just four of them. I mean, they got Billy <laughs> Preston, too. But, yeah. wow, that's, that's the songwriting. Was, it's exciting, you know. And that's what yeah. jazz warm up, you know. I mean, he was so electrified by that. And, you know, that that was, and they were electrified by early rock and roll, obviously. And, uh, yeah. That's what it was all about, that that true thing. I mean, the Beatles played together even when they're making, you know, Abbey Road. They, they started with them playing in the studio together. I think Tom said that at some point, right? He said that I, that's when he realized that, oh, you just need to find some of your friends, get your instruments out and play, and you can be a band. Oh, I, oh okay, well, that sort of I can relate to that. Can't relate to, you know, Sinatra or some of those guys, but I can relate to that. Oh, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, he loved it, you know, when he saw the Beatles. They were self-contained. They didn't need any other musicians. And they're, they're so cool, and they're friends, and they're writing their own songs. They're doing yeah. everything. That's always what he wanted to be. Well, you know, he never wanted to be a, a solo artist. No, no, for sure. So, you know, obviously, you write the book, and I think it came out, was the original version 2005? Did I get, do I have that right? That's right, yeah. And then the re-release was nine, uh, 2019, I think, and which is the one, the extended edition. <laughs> which I have here, which, watching this video, anyone, you should go buy this immediately if you don't have it already. Thank you. You know, we did that because the first one actually went out of print. People bought every one, you know, after he died. And they were selling him for uh, so much money on the internet, it was crazy. And, yeah. So, I'm, I'm, it, you know, uh, he and I shared the copyright, so I needed Dana's permission to do a new version, and the publisher wanted to. So, yeah. Uh, it's so great. So she, she not only said yes, but she wrote, we did a little interview for the... Uh, for the new version that she's in talking about Tom. Yeah. And, and you know, from her point of view, it's beautiful too. And Tom, what a sweet guy he was. You know, another great example of that is when he was talking about Howie Epstein, who he loved, the bass player he stole from Del Shannon's band. Yeah. Uh, he got really messed up on heroin. Uh, it was really hard for Tom. And Tom t told me about it. And the first time he told me about it, he was so dark. It was so sad. We're talking about his uh, emotions, you know, being felt. When yep. he was happy, I felt, you know, and, when he was sad, and that was the saddest of all. Yeah. And, and after that, he felt really bad. And according to Dana, he came out and he said, all I did was talk about how, how, how sad, you know, how he was and his drugs. And yeah, I felt terrible. I didn't say anything nice about him. And and Dana said, uh, well, call Paul and tell him. That. And he goes, I guess I could do that. As <laughs> if I said, oh, we've done that, Tom. You know, and he, he was so sweet. He, you know, he could have just said, we have to do that over. But he goes, would you mind? I mean, I know he's been a whole day, but I just didn't get it right. Would you yeah. mind? You know, what a yeah. sweet guy. He do that. But it also showed to me he wanted to get it right for Howie. I mean, that's what it meant most to him. Like, it's Howie. And he wanted to say good things about him. And it was so dark. And it showed me what a good guy he was. Like, this is the book. And people are going to remember this. And Howie was a good guy. He loved Howie. Yeah. And he felt really bad about what happened. Well, a, just a sensational musician all around. A great producer, brilliant, great on him. Wasn't even a bass player, really. He was a guitarist, right? And sort of, well, I'll play bass then. And the best sort of vocal foil for Tom. I mean, Scott Thurston, I absolutely adore, and he's a phenomenal vocalist too. Stan was a great vocalist, but Howie, they just they just matched. That was a pair that was supposed to sing together, right? Yeah. And that was that was what got him in the band. He said, there are other a lot of great bass players, but his singing. And he goes, yeah. and then the heartbreak. You got to sing your part perfectly on stage every time. It's not like Keith Richards kind of, you know, we try to get it. You know, 
not on the heartbreak. It's you gotta get it. And Howie was a great singer. Yeah, really yeah. Great. And you're right, a great producer. You did a John Prine album that oh, won a Grammy. It's my Most favorite. That's my favorite John Prine album. Yeah. Isn't it? How cool. Absolutely, yeah. I like well, he's, well, he's, I think he broke through in Chicago, right? That's being a Chicago oh, yeah. boy. Yeah. He, was, he was a local hero. And I, I knew him quite a while. I was, I was very sad. He died when lockdown started. That was so sad. I was absolutely, again, another artist I didn't get to see live. And I, I, I same thing. And it's one of those things, I think, that when that happens, you think, you know what? I'm not going to make that mistake anymore. I need to go start seeing these guys and making more of an effort to go and see these people who I really want to see because you never know. You just don't know if they're going to be there tomorrow, right? John Fry, when he started, he was one of the guys in Chicago. I was like, Yeah. But he came up with those masterpiece songs from the right on right, right from the start. You know, that first like, album. Well, who does that? You know, you write know. Just, just amazing songs on your first album. I mean, it was a good challenge for him because he had to match that for the rest of his career. <laughs> that was hard. Yeah. Amazing. For sure. Did you That's ever speak to fun. did you ever speak to him? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can find my John Fine interview online, but I'll have to uh, find that one, yeah. But yeah, because you know, I knew the people. I grew up in those clubs. Uh, yeah, Steve Good really helped him get his start. Got helped him get his uh, record contract. Someone I knew and gave me a little uh, songwriting lesson. So I was, you know, that's where I grew up. I just love those guys. I was much younger, but when they emerged together and John Prine, it's like wow, songwriting. I was writing uh, like imitation Beatles, Simon and Garfunkel, surreal lyrics. Then I was about yep. twelve or so. And Steve Goodman was like, uh, he heard one of my songs. He goes, that's good, but. I could have probably said that in two lines, that whole song. <laughs> you know, it's prime where it's poetic, but you know, it really says something. Every, and that was a challenge, but it was good for me because, you know. Uh, yeah. So, you know, John Prime and all the Chicago songwriters, that was a good, a very fertile place. I started playing in those clubs when I, when I was young. Yeah. When I came to, again, another artist who I came to, being from England and growing up in England, I didn't grow up with sort of, you know, Americana and American folk and those types of things. Dylan, my dad was into, but, so I didn't know any about any of those guys, Jim Croce and, or Croce, I don't know how it's pronounced, and John Prine and and even sort of getting into some of the country stuff. That all happened for me sort of within the last 10 to 15 years of being in Canada. And again, it's that thing of, like, why did I not know about any of this? Like, oh my God, this would have totally influenced the way I, I write songs if I'd known about, you, you don't have to, you don't, maybe you don't even need a bridge. You know, maybe like uh, Roy Orbison messed around with structures of songs all the time. You know, he really did more than what anyone is. Yeah. Trippy, I mean, four That's verses and no chorus. Like, okay, well, I guess you can do that then because it works if you're good enough. So, right, right. But John Prine, I mean, he was he was special. And uh, I just remember when he emerged, it was kind of mind blowing. I was like, wow, this is this is yeah. different, you know. But you know, for years he wasn't well known. I mean, he was a local hero in Chicago, but I never knew he would become. As well known as he did, and yeah, sadly, in the music industry nothing better for your reputation than when you die. You know, he's won so many awards since then. You know, yep. I know his wife Fiona is great, and his kids. We did a thing together at the Grammy Museum that's on on YouTube where I interview him live. Okay, and talk about humble. <laughs> he's the most yeah. humble of any. Anyone. I want to make a note. And, and different. Tom was diligent and made a point of it. John Prine was lazy. He goes, anytime I'm writing a song, <laughs> someone wants a hot dog, I get the hot dog. <laughs> you know, he didn't write songs for years, but Tom never did that. Tom, yeah, but it wasn't because he was a pro, he loved it. You know, they even yeah. when he go on vacation, he wanted to write songs, but he loved it more than anything. Well, as a songwriter yourself, you, you know that you can't turn it off. Now, not everyone has as free flowing a tap as Tom Petty did, but you can't turn that off if they come. And when they come, you've got to do something with them, you've got to sit down, and you've got to write something, otherwise, you go, you'd go crazy, right? Yeah, if you turn them off, you can. Kill yourself and turn it into a different. <laughs> never understand people. Mean, yeah, never understand people. Sometimes you'll talk to people. Oh, you, you still playing? No, I don't play drums anymore. Really? What do you mean you don't play yeah. anymore? Oh, Ooh. what <laughs> you got that, there? If you're playing, you're you're a musician. Then. <laughs> <laughs> What's that guitar? How do you, what kind of guitar is that? It's an SG. Oh, it's a blue. blue. Is it blue? It's black. Does it look? Oh, blue? It's black. It kind of it had a little bit of blue just because the light yeah, lost. A little understated. Oh, <laughs> it's not the way Angus Young plays it. Who? Angus, Ang you? Angus is not the way Angus plays it. <laughs> um, so you were talking about Dana earlier, and we've, we've kind of mentioned her a couple of times. It always strikes me that after Dana comes into Tom's life, the songs 
change a little bit. And there's still, you know, when he needs to access a little bit of fury, that's that's still there. But it feels like, especially when you listen, when I listen to Mojo, that's just a free, loose, happy songwriter going in. You know what I mean? And I think the just interviews, like you said, Dana telling him to call you and sort of encouraging him to just be, you know, be himself and, and be free to sort of express himself. Do you, do you ever get that sense that there was a there was a sort of a, a seismic shift in his temperament when she sort of became started loving him? Basically, I guess is really what happened, right? So. Absolutely. It was a huge seismic shift. That's a good way of putting it. And I've written about it in the uh, intro to the new one. Yeah. But as I mentioned, I saw him, you know, right after the divorce and uh, when he was living in the chicken shack when he was single. And he was sad, you know, going through stuff. And uh, But it was different. When we were doing the book, he was living in Malibu with Dana. And he was a happy man. And he was yeah. truly in love. It was real love. And she's a beautiful person, but such a sweet soul, too. And yeah. Tom loved that about her. He'd say, you know, she never says anything bad about anyone. She's just so supportive and just one of those people. Yeah. But a beautiful person and a true Tom Petty fan. I mean, they met because she was such a fan. She was going to his shows, you yeah. know, and would meet him afterwards. And and he wrote Angel Dream the first night they met. Though so they didn't get together for five years after that. Not crazy. But but she helped integrate. I mean, we're talking about that he wasn't necessarily the uh, an easygoing guy. He he would not listen to his old albums. Because right. all he heard was the imperfections or yes. the, you know, bad memories that were associated. And and she put on one and he goes, oh, I'm sorry. I don't listen to those here. And she goes, well, I, I'm sorry. I'm I'm a huge Tom Petty fan. So, what I like <laughs> to so deal with it. And so she told me, so, you know, I listened to it. And, you know what? It wasn't so bad. <laughs> yeah, we knew that time. He was surprised. And, and so, and also for this book, because uh, I would come in knowing the song so well. Yeah. He said, tell me what, like after what he goes, next time, tell me, are we cool? Yeah. I mean, he goes, uh, next time, uh, tell me what songs you want to do in advance and I'll do my homework. You know, he, he wanted to be prepared. Um, and I lost my thread, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, it's okay. No, but it's, again, it's that there's a, there's a part in the book where we were talking about, I think, I think it's refugees talking about, and he, you know, Mike Campbell obviously wrote, most of the music or the, the sort of the general frame of that song. And Tom says, he says, Oh, I was just really happy to be able to play on that song. Like what? You're Tom Petty. Like you wrote one of the best rock lyrics of all time on top of this song. Like again, just have that sort of keep coming back to the word humility. I, I think that it just comes through in spades all through the, all through your book and through all the interviews and everything else. Right. Right. At the same time, he doesn't want to underplay his, you know, I think that to me, yeah. he didn't put it that way. Because he took refugee and turned it into what it was, and oh. some people often, I mean, Mike gave him great stuff, but there's so much of it. Yeah. And Tom said often that he, he didn't talk about it, but he would sometimes cut him up or you know change him around. You know, that wasn't exactly as Mike had him. Yeah. But and so there were many great ones he passed on, but the one because Tom would spend a long time to get him right. But refugee came fast. That was one that he yep. did get that really fast. And yep. uh, he also said about that that. That was really what he, he knew. Jimmy Ovine was a real great producer because he really made a great record of it. He loved it. Tom was really excited the record that Jimmy made of that. And I, I agree. It's a great sounding record. And a great song. You know, it's a wonderful song. Yeah. And it, like I said, the, the album as a whole, as a whole, the sonic sort of quality of that album and what Jimmy Iovine did with that, it did change the direction that rock music went in to an extent, right? I mean, like those, yeah. those big thundering drums weren't really, that wasn't really a thing until he did that. And Tom, you know, Tom said that he wasn't always a fan of it. And I think the come bringing, you know, Rick Rubin definitely, to my mind, produced the best sounding um, of the sort of, you know, the three. I always think of like Jimmy Iovine trilogy, even though I know that Southern Accents was an Iovine album, it, it kind of isn't at the same time. And then you've got the Rick Rubin three, and then you've got sort of, you know, the the last three. And I always think of them in those threes and then the, the, the ones in between. But that one <laughs> just sounds so freaking different to anything else that was around at the time. You know, consider a full moon fever, the stuff you did with Jeff Lynn, part of that? Yeah, I mean, I so I, I think of it in, in periods, also in periods. So there's the early period, which I think of sort of up to let me up, I've had enough, but not Southern Accents, which I think fits more into the middle period. And then the middle period goes till about uh, Songs from She's the One, and maybe, and well, Echo as well, and then everything after that, I think, is late period. That's the way I sort of, I always sort of frame it in my mind. <laughs> To me, there's such a huge change in sound and, and the writing too. Yeah. Like, he started with Jeff Lynn, 
and then you know the album after that uh into the great wide open yeah you know the the first one full moon fever was a solo album but the second and the band wasn't crazy but the, they weren't on it yep. but the second one was with Declan and the band and i think it's a great album but uh tom said he loved working with jeff and jeff was he said the first person that showed him that it could be fun recording that it, yeah. he didn't have to start over and rick helped him with that too and also his digital recording help they didn't have to make a cassette and then start completely over yeah which was you know the problem that's why he smashed his hand because he couldn't get the debt you know the, the record it sounded like the demo you know that he got at home and that was so much better for him so i found it was really then that his singing got better and his songwriting just seemed a little uh more joyful at times and less intense you know and uh but especially the vocals some of those early vocals they sound kind of tortured at times like yeah that's intense but he's younger too but then he gets such rich resonant vocals in his later years and uh and he as he said he very rarely used even any echo i mean some echo but very like little reverb it was almost flat so you yep. really hear the word. and that was partially jeff but also with jeff lynn he uh they wrote all those songs he just loved like jeff showed him recording could be fun and you know they wrote all those songs in one night for full moon theater right. and then recorded them because jeff had wanted to go back to <laughs> to, to, uh, but Tom really said Jeff Lynne changed his life. He really said, uh, and, and when, when Jeff Lynne got a star in the Walk of Fame, he said he thought he was the greatest producer he knew and also the greatest musician. Well, Jeff so, Lynne's, I mean, Jeff Lynne has the resume to back that up, I think, right? <laughs> you know, it's not right, like not all not, time, you know. Like, they don't like that, you know, the, the different sound necessarily. You know, it's funny how people are. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Tom integrated all of that. And, you know, I know the Heartbreakers had a hard time about doing, uh, you know, but Tom, stepping away from the band but at that last night they played all those songs you know at the yeah. end, you know that whole tour, those were all heartbreaker songs ultimately you know even you know it started when he did work with dave stewart and don't come around here no more yeah that started you know as just a four track with a drum machine that dave had and, and i've worked with dave too on the book and uh but then he brought in the heartbreakers at the end you know just to, to include them but th that started like when they weren't the kind of thing like, oh, you're doing, you know, you're exploring other musicians. Great, Tom, go for it. You know, they, yeah, with you know, with good reason. You know, they didn't want to be replaced. Oh, for sure. And like you said, I mean, around the time of Full Moon Fever, there was also the Wilburys, like you said, and then Jeff comes back in. Um, so you could, yeah, you could see that sort of not really resentment, but like is that uncertainty about, well, are we still a going yeah, concern? But but of course, so he always wanted, he just, wanted, just wanted to be in a band, though. He just wanted to be in a band with people he trusted, right? And he was never going to leave Mike Campbell, for God's sakes. That would be ridiculous. No, and, and the Wilburys never make a lot of money or to have a hit. It was just pure fun. You know, he talked yeah. about that. He's so happy. Dad and Dana were the happiest. So. But he just had so much fun. Because there's only so many people he could look up to. Yeah. There's only Bob Dylan, Roy Orbison, uh, and Jeff Lynn. Yeah. And uh, who am I leaving on? I mean, George. George Harrison. <laughs> yeah, that guy. Just, just George Harrison, you know. <laughs> and George meant so much to him. I mean, that, that yeah. was another thing about Tom. He would become close friends with George Harrison, and Beatle, but they became very close friends. I mean, very close. Yeah, for sure. And George said, like, the first time they really got to know each other, he goes, no, you're in my life now. I'm not going to let you out. He said that time. <laughs> and I've met a lot to Tom. Well, no, I think, you know, you have to be a good person to attract good people into your sort of sphere of friends, right? You don't, you know, if you're an asshole, if you, you, need to, you need to be a good hang. That's the thing in the music industry and in, in a lot of places, if you're hard to work with, people won't want to work with you and they won't want to be around you. Well, everyone wanted to work with Tom and a lot of people did. A lot of people got their wish because he was so generous with his with his creative time, right? Right. And he respected talent. Well, Stevie Nicks yep. wanted to join the band. And <laughs> he didn't want to join the band, but he loved working with her. He loved yep. when she would sing and like, the insider. Uh, but yeah, yeah, abs absolutely. Right on. So were there any, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Obviously there were two albums that you didn't get to talk to Tom about, Mojo and Hypnotic Eyes. I think everything, it was up to Last DJ, right? I think that was the last mm -hmm. album in there. So, well, I think the two and then Mud Crutch 2 yeah, might have been, yeah, right. I think. Yeah, I um, Mud Crutch album. Um, so were there any songs from, if you, th if you think of like Echo and, uh, sorry, um, Mojo and Hypnotic Eye, are there any questions that you'd love you'd love to have asked him about any of those, any of those songs or the process on those two albums? Because obviously Mojo, they went into the 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 clubhouse and recorded it there, right? They didn't go into the studio, they just recorded it in the clubhouse and it was essentially live off the floor. So that would have been a great, you know, some great conversations to talk to talk about some of those songs there, right? Yeah. 
No, most of his stuff started like that. They were really the guys all playing together. Yeah. We could work out the arrangement first. Like Tom had this thing, uh, like if, if, if there's going to be a riff in the song, play it while you're recording. You don't add the riff, you know, like in the recording yeah. after. <laughs> you, you know, the uh, pure, pure, purity thing again. Yeah. But uh, Hypnotic Eye especially, like uh, I thought that was really sophisticated writing. I mean, that's his last record. And like we, I mentioned American uh, Dream Part B. That's a really dejected person. I mean, the American Dream was that you're not going to do better than your parents. And every generation is going to yep. be even better here. And hasn't worked out that way. And Tom, yeah. he was really astute at seeing those changes. You know, he saw the change in the music industry pretty much before other people. The one thing he didn't see was that uh, how the internet could destroy the music business because yeah. he, he was giving away free downloads at first. When I, when we, I think it was when we were starting the book that the internet was kind of starting. And yeah. I said, don't you ever worry that that could just replace it? He goes, well, I don't think that would ever happen. <laughs> he was wrong. Yeah. Unfortunately. Used to be the the uh, people nominated for best song for Grammy. They were usually great songs, and it changed. You know? <laughs> like eight people wrote the song, and they were cultural event songs, like a Beyonce yeah. song. But you know, Tom never shifted. That was a cool thing. He never kind of even once kind of. I mean, they were on MTV, and I, maybe there's one song that had uh, synthesizer on it. But he was always about rock and roll and keeping it pure. Yeah. I mean, he was changing. He wasn't like using old stuff. He was always innovating. Uh, but in terms of those last two albums, that, that's what I would just want to talk to him about where he was because that's a very dark song. And uh, yeah, I mean, like we're saying, DJ Austin was quite dark, but that's a very dark album in, in so many ways. For sure, it is. Yeah, but then and you also get there's some there's some brightness on there too, right? You know, and it, so you get that. And I think he always did that. He always had that balance between I, I black and white. Right? What's that? Sorry? Yeah, yeah. The song "I Get High" was, is that? It? I think Isn't that's. Right? I think that one's on there. Yeah. Upbeat song. Where was that previous? But yeah, there's always those. I mean, Tom, like, he says, you don't want it to be too heavy. He goes, but you don't want it to be lightweight either. I mean, you didn't want to write ditties, you know? Like, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah but it's nice. Like I said, I mean, Shadow People's on there, Power Drunk's on there. You know, <laughs> there's some Fault Lines yeah. is on there. Like I said, there's some serious weight to that album. <laughs> yeah. What else? I what else is on that album? Can you tell me what, what are the others? Yeah, let's have a look. So we got, so it's American Dream Plan B. Fault Lines, yeah. Red River, Full Grown Boy. I mean, straight out the gate, that's four fantastic songs. All You Can Carry, brilliant track. Power Drunk, one of my favorites. Forgotten Man, which was a live staple for years after that, right? Sins of My Youth, You Get Me High, Burnt Out Town, that's... Shadow People, and then playing Dumb is the on the on the vinyl album. But yeah, yeah so it's yeah, You Get Me High, that was such an like live, that's so anthemic. It was such a simple song. And yeah. Just a perfect song. And it doesn't kind of get mentioned much, but he played that live quite but often it was one of those like wow yeah this is one, another one of those, yeah, so many of his songs i thought if they would have released in the singles would have been hit singles 100%. You know, every song they released that was on mtv every single one became a hit single as soon as people heard him you know in an mtv they heard him over and over but he didn't have one that failed because his songs were so great there's so many more i think it could have been that well i think it's it always blows my mind that we're only two singles off hard promises they released the waiting and a woman in love and nothing else is that right? Something big could have been released off that album. You know, King's Road probably could have been a single. That's a great, upbeat, rock. You know, there's, there's, there's singles, like you said. So I always wonder about that too. Like, who who chooses the, the singles? I think early in an artist's career, the label does have a lot of say in that, right? They'll say, no, this is the one we're releasing. But once you get to yeah. a certain stage, you think that Tom Petty's saying, no, this is the first single, this is the next one. So I kind of wonder where you'd that, think. you would think. you think. I mean, often he was upset, like there's certain, like a, a ballad couldn't be released. You couldn't put Southern Accents as a single or, or yeah. the insider too slow. That was the thinking. So sometimes he, he, he didn't like the choices. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, when he, when he brought in Full Moon Fever to the record company, they rejected it. They said they didn't hear a hit. I know, I know. Yeah, that level of it. So, so even with Tom Penny, he had to deal with that. And it really bummed him out. I mean, he had to go back. And, I mean, ultimately it did come out, but it, it was months and it really upset him. They said they didn't yeah. hear a hit. They had five hits on it. I mean, it doesn't, it, you know, the, the songs that sort of, def, at least three of the songs that define Tom Petty and the sort of public consciousness are on that album. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, Free Fall, the most famous song ever is on that. They yeah. didn't hear a hit. Come on. Yeah, I won't back and down. This has a track record. They should have trusted him. <laughs> yes. But to me, an amazing year, it was a unanimous, I mean, there are many people, unanimous. Not one guy said, yeah. And he told me, then they went to a party and Lenny Morker, the ex president of the Warner Brothers was there and 
he was with Jeff Lynne and they were bummed out because they rejected the album and we got four great <laughs> songs. And then he said, can I hear them? And they didn't have the album, but they said, well, we'll play one. They played him free fall. And Lenny goes, that's a hit. I mean, just for hearing them play, he knew. Yeah. Lenny knew. But the new guys that came in, they weren't they weren't musicians. They didn't know music in the scene. They were marketing guys. So. Yeah, for sure. That was the problem. It was different. It had a different sound than Tom's previous album. So, yeah. This doesn't sound the same. This could be a problem. <laughs> Listen to the damn songs. It's the same thing with the first album, right? I was talking to John Scott about that. He says, how do you listen to that album and get to Breakdown, which is the second song? I mean, the first, you know, uh, the first track, which I've completely escaped my mind now, isn't my favorite Tom Petty song. So I could sort of see you've got the leather jacket and the bullets and you get that first track and you might think, well, okay, that's not exactly what I think. But as soon as you hear Breakdown, surely to God you think, oh, oh, actually, no, this guy's. And then when you get to American Girl, how do you not see that? As a, as a Your job yeah. is to recognize talent and you don't see that? Are you kidding me? It's insane. It's not uncommon. I know a, a, a critic here who told me, like, in 50 years, Tom Petty won't be remembered. <laughs> I go, are you kidding? He goes, name one song. It's good. I go, hey, free fall. He goes, not a good song. <laughs> okay. Oh, Tom is so many famous songs. <laughs> yeah. But I also know a radio guy here who, at one of Tom's, after Tom's death, they had a, a celebration and uh, of him. And he kind of said proudly to me, you know, you know I never played Tom on the, on the radio, not once. And I go, really? Because you couldn't hear one Tom Petty song you thought was good for radio? Really? Wow. He was proud of it. He was on a college radio station that was hip. But even that, uh, that's not hip. He played Tom Petty for 40 years. Come yeah. on. He's What's, still proud of it. Now, that's people trying to be edgy, right? That's just people trying to be edgy. No, I'm, I'm too cool for Tom Petty. Well, I'll more fool you then, you know? <laughs> right. And there's, you know, like, there's a lot of those critics' favorites and musicians who regular people don't really like that much, but they're always talking about but. People love Tom Petty. I mean, you yeah. couldn't deny that. After, you know, a while, you must have, they must have caught on, you would think. You would have thought so. And again, I mean, Full Moon Fever comes at a, a time in the band's career where they're not exactly fading. They're not. They're, they're touring regularly. And they're hitting big concerts in big venues. So, again, why, why don't you just yeah. trust this guy? And you've got Jeff Lynne involved as well, who, again, has a track record and is, is a pretty – Pretty great producer. I mean, I think he'd just done Cloud Nine with George Harrison. It's not like he doesn't have a pedigree. Where's the problem here, people? You know, Tom's album was finished before Cloud Nine, but it came out. Oh, was afterwards. it? Oh, I didn't realize yeah. that. Okay. Yeah, I, I learned that from the, the interview. I didn't know that either because it didn't seem that way. But and also, George was so happy with Cloud Nine. It was his first hit in a long time. And that made yeah. Tom happy. George would come to LA and they'd have the greatest time together. <laughs> they just loved each other. It was really sweet. Yeah, but yeah, you know that 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 time. So that that's why I was a little surprised you didn't mention Jeff uh, in terms of his producers because he had a big impact on Tom. And right, brought a lot of joy into Tom's life. Oh yeah, sorry. I mean, I think I think probably in terms of the producers, I think of like three sets of albums, and it's because it's back. It's almost it's back to back, right? Where Jeff kind of came in Full Moon Fever and then did Highway or then did Into the Great Wide Open and then did Highway Companion, but they were sort of they were spread apart, right? They were a little bit more. There was a little bit more gap between us. Well, the great but yeah, Highway Companion was later. Yeah. So. That's when I was doing the book. That's what they were doing that. And that doesn't, that has a different sound. It doesn't sound totally like different. a different. And it's cool. You know, it's, it's sparser. I love, I love that album. Yeah. That album makes me so happy because that's what he was working on when we were doing the book. And he was making it there in the studio at his home where we'd meet. So he'd play me the songs. He'd listen to this. Oh, and no as he probably, way. Yeah. And it's probably, it was pretty deaf. So he would play me them super loud. I mean, really, <laughs> and it'd be so exciting, like turn turn that car around. That was the first one I heard. Oh, and then man. he went on vacation with, with Dana and he finished down south, which I just think is a masterpiece. It's like yeah. just it's funny, but it's just brilliant in every way. And he was so proud of down south. Yeah. He said after finishing down south, he goes, That's the kind of song that makes you want to do it again. And he just <laughs> loves song and make him and 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 also um Round the Roses. He finished down south and around the roses on vacation with Dana. Dana wanted a vacation. And Tom said, okay, I'm not even going to bring a guitar. <laughs> well, after the second day, like, he asked the hotel to get him a guitar. And, they <laughs> and Dana was like, yeah. Yeah, okay. so, yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I mean, one of, again, one of my favorite Tom Petty songs is off that. Well, two of my favorite Tom Petty songs, um, Saving Grace, which is, again, just a superb guitar riff. And then um, Big Weekend, which is just the most fun you know what I mean? That's that, just that very free. Yeah, loose. Really, kind of, so, I never it's mentioned Big Week. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, a, cool it's a driving song. You know, it's, it's, it's a driving song. It's a summer song. It's a. It's just a fun. Yeah. 
you know, and, and lives. You really in, know you. Live, li- oh yeah, and li- lives in a uh, brick house painted white and brown. Those little lyrical details that you think, God damn it, I wish I could have written that. And it's a, it's a real sort of yeah. it's almost a throwaway, but it's it just it makes that picture of that house so much more evocative. You know, Absolutely. his later songs had a lot of those funny details, you know, yeah. playful with the lyrics, and uh, she, he had a tattoo too. You know, those kind of like funny yep. lines, and just perfectly having fun. You know, with the writing. Absolutely. But it always worked. It was well crafted. It wasn't sloppy. Yeah, there are a lot of those funny details. Yeah, I love and like I said, getting getting into the getting into the podcast and, and, and trying to trying to do this has really deepened my appreciation for those songs because you just hear so much more in them. And I wanted to ask you, so after you've gone through the catalogue with Tom and you've sort of got the all the information now and you've got the material to to write the book, how much did that change your appreciation for his music as well as him as a person but more the music how did that did it, did it change it in specific ways or did it just sort of give you that deeper love of the music there were, there were a lot of songs i got to know better and even songs that were just considered throwaways or you know ones that aren't famous yeah i mean a lot of them i already knew but so many of his songs were great i was just so impressed by his songwriting the first time i interviewed him i mentioned two gunslingers which is on into the great wide open it's a song about the old west but yep. it's an existential song where the the gunslingers are questioning their job, like, yes. you know, I don't have to control them. You know, it's, it's not a job you can really sustain too long. And uh, <laughs> and I mentioned that song to him, and he was so happy because no one ever mentions that song, and it's such a cool song. And there's so many like that, you know. Yeah. Like, In Spider is such a special song, but there's so many, you know, the the deep cuts, but they're not obscure, strange songs. They're amazing songs. Yeah. So they couldn't singles most likely because they're some of them are too odd though i think two gunslingers might have been a single but but they're just such such great songs so beautifully yeah. you know realized you know he would really he, he he never took any songs uh lightly you know he had what he called his a songs and his b songs and yeah his b songs were the ones where not every part was up to you know they weren't good enough and those wouldn't get on the albums and that's unusual you know other people they only they only have B songs, maybe if that, you know, it's like come on, whatever, you know, they're gonna make the album. But absolutely. Fine. Well, it's uh, genuinely, I mean, you know, obviously I'm a huge Tom Petty fan, but I think objectively, if you think about the quality of the songwriting, the quality of the musicianship and the arrangement and the production, most bands aren't anywhere near the stuff that was released on playback or on the anthologies where they were never released because Tom obviously didn't think that they Cut, they didn't make the cut they didn't make the grade and they're better than most bands greatest hits genuinely i mean i, I do genuinely think that you know it's not just a, i'm not just pandering i think that's definitely true i agree even like the, we were mentioning the mud crutch album not only did he play with them but he wrote great songs for that album those songs are great absolutely just anything i mean he always did that he was always he loved writing songs but he'd always give it his full thing you know he never yeah. he never lazy when it came to songwriting but he was also, he just had a great knack for it, too. I mean, he was yeah, just sure. a songwriter. So often I'd hear one of his songs, it's like, yeah, that's good. And then it just gets you in a way, you know, and it's, there's more to it than you know. And there's a depth and the music helps you understand the words. And it all comes yeah. together in such a beautiful way. It's remarkable. And it's all very it's deliberate, too, right? And that's the other thing of it is you know that it's deliberate. You know that it's actually been designed that way, that it's not, that's not happened by accident. Well, sometimes you'll get happy accidents in the studio, but that's, it's been written that way. It's actually been written that way, and it's been put together very specifically because that's the way it needs to happen. And, I, and again, that attention to detail that he had and the work ethic and the sort of dedication to, well, I'm not going to put out crap to my fans because I love my fans. I'm only going to give them the absolute best thing that I can do. And I think he sustained that yeah. for an entire career, like, you know, 40-year recording career which again most people don't sustain that for five well let's let's switch gears a little bit and talk about um some of your music because i'd love to I'd l- expose my listeners to the stuff that you've put out there because i've been listening to it a little bit lately and there's a few questions that i had for you about that because i think that they're yeah. really int- especially like orange avenue they're very different al- a- albums for certainly and orange avenue is very eclectic i think and very interesting and at times i sort of i feel a bit of cat stevens in there and sometimes a british band called supergrass with the way that some of the horns are arranged and that you get some stones or bowie or sting or you get all these different influences coming in and you get this hodgepodge but there's a really consistent strong through line because you've got such a distinct unique voice that it only really actually sounds like paul zolo so i wanted to ask you um with that first batch of songs for that album, for the first solo album, did you 
write a set of songs for an album or with those songs that had been sort of kicking around a little while and you decided, okay, I've actually got enough songs. I'm going to sit down and try and finish these and get them into something that sounds somewhat coherent and record an album. What was the process for that? Well, prior to recording that album, I'd been playing with a band in LA because when I came to LA, there was no, I was kind of a folky like John Bryan. Right. Those kind of but there's no hardly a, any acoustic places you could do that in LA. Uh, so I got together a band called the Ghosters and I made an album with them first, but I was always writing a lot of songs. Right. So it wasn't that I wrote songs for an album ever. It was which ones to, to put on and is that too many? <laughs> it's like, you know, yep. often, especially with Orange Avenue, well, both of them, there was kind of the uh, the tendency or the, the the hope to like make them Sergeant Pepper or something just to do everything. <laughs> especially back then, we were actually in recording studios, analog, you know, multi-track and to me, there's nothing more exciting. I became a journalist when I came to LA. But my dad didn't like like that right. word. He thought, you know, journalists write about war and stuff, not about music. Right. <laughs> but I, I never wanted to write about music. I didn't study journalism. I studied song. I want to always be a songwriter. And that it's always been my thing. I was right. writing songs all through, and my songs have been informed by the journey. And but in some ways it took me away from that, you know, away from yeah. my band. Uh, yeah. so Orange Avenue, uh, there were there are a lot of songs I wanted to record. And now I think there's, there's some odd choices over here right now. <laughs> but uh, I'm recording some, I have so many songs. I've been doing a lot of cool writing too. And I'm just so eager to, I've just recently started recording new ones. Oh, nice. So Where's there's going to be another album? Oh, yes. There's, there's much more to come. Fantastic. Okay, that was my conversation with Paul Zolo that I recorded a few weeks ago. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, I found Paul to be wonderfully warm and friendly and, of course, very, very articulate and intelligent about Tom's music. Um, he's also a fantastic musician in his own right, and we did talk a little bit about his music. I would have loved to talk a little bit more about his music, to be honest. Um, but it is a Tom Petty Project uh, podcast. So, um, But go check out his albums, Orange Avenue and Universal Cure which are on um, all your streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple Music, those kinds of things. He's got a very unique voice uh, and he's an excellent songwriter, a craftsman, a great musician. And I think you'll enjoy a lot of the stuff that he's put out there. Um, again, before I wrap things up completely, just a reminder that um, the humanitarian efforts in the Ukraine are critically important to the people who live there. And I would urge you, if you can, um, go check out the link in the episode notes and please donate to the Red Cross or Relief Fund or any of the other uh, great funds that are going on and, and to get resources and supplies and, re you know, just to get people out of there or get them safe or get them the things that they need. So if you can do that, that would be appreciated, I'm sure, by the, by the Ukrainian people. Um, don't forget to follow me on Facebook and Instagram at the Tom Petty Project and on Twitter at Tom Petty Project. And of course, you can find me on, on uh, YouTube. Uh, so go follow, like, subscribe, whichever is applicable on those platforms. And again, please leave a review or a rating if you haven't done that already. It does help and I appreciate it. Um, I love talking to you on social media. So get a hold of me. Um, it's been great so far in terms of sort of getting people onto the podcast for a, a sort of fan guest because I've, I've people have been approaching me and I haven't had to really ask too many people to say, oh, will you come on the podcast? Because and everyone, and I find this, everyone you ask to talk about Tom Petty, if they love Tom Petty, they want to talk about Tom Petty. So it's really not an issue getting people on, so which is which is fantastic. Um, a reminder again that the Tom Petty Project is not affiliated with the Tom Petty Estate in any way. So if you're looking for official merchandise, please go to TomPetty.com. If you want to watch videos and uh, listen to music, uh, please do that through official channels and go check out the YouTube channel. Um, and don't forget to check out the Tom Petty Nation and Tom Petty Fans Forever. Facebook groups. And again, Gwen Jones is the, the moderator and the creator of the latter. So I'm sure you'd really enjoy that space. Um, it's a great community and come and join us. Um, until we meet again next week, keep listening to and sharing Tom's music. Uh, try to be kind. Try to say I love you to someone at least once a day, at least once. Uh, stay safe and healthy. Uh, and I'll be back with you next week to talk about track one from side two of Damn the Torpedoes. Don't do me like that. Bye-bye.